All right, welcome back. Hopefully stretching our legs will help to wake us up a bit. Um, <clears throat> the next one on the docket here is another OSD discussion about locally repairable codes. Um, this one's going to be by Loic. Um, Loic, you want to go ahead and take a pass through the blueprint and get us started? Hey. Um, so, um, did I start now? Yep, fire away. Okay. Um, I will start for the benefit of people who are not familiar with that with a short introduction, uh, which is on the, at the URL which I passed in IRC. So the idea of locally repairable codes is basically to take a residual code and apply it recursively to a subset of chunks. That is, we compute um, coding chunks for, let's say, 10 blocks, and um, we create four uh, parity blocks or coding blocks. And then for each five blocks, we compute one more, which is presumably located in a uh, place uh, that is the same rack as the five other blocks. So the idea is that if one of the blocks is missing out of the six that you see uh, to the left of the drawing, so X1 to X5 and S1, if one of them is missing, let's say they are all in one rack, in theory, you uh, only need to move blocks within the rack. You do not need to cross racks boundaries and go fetch the blocks that are in the next track, which may save you bandwidth. And is that's uh, basically the goal for locally repairable codes. It uh, previously was called uh, pyramid uh, because, well, I, I, I don't understand much of all that, my, but uh, my understanding is that pyramid code involves uh, more complex mathematics tricks to do the that kind of thing. But I went for a simpler approach, uh, which is basically using existing uh, erasure code plugins who do all the encoding and decoding and just engineering them together to achieve this locality. And that's uh, what I'm going to explain, and that's in the pad this time. So uh, during the giant uh, summit, I proposed um, a way to do that, which was inconveniently complicated to explain. And hopefully um, I figured out something that is simpler. So uh, in the pad, uh, you see chunk number and uh, zero to seven. So that, the idea is that let's say we have uh, an erasure code um, crush wall set that gives us eight OSDs. So let's also say that half of them are in a rack, the other half are in, other, in another rack. So we want to apply locality so that we can recover for, uh, within a rack. The step one would be to do the global encoding uh, using the two racks. So when you see in the line under zero to seven, you see a D, it means the erasure code plugin is going to use this OSD to store data. And then the plugin computes coding chunks, which are C, and the coding chunks are stored in the corresponding OSD. That is for step one, we have one coding chunk in OSD one and one coding chunk in OSD five. Then uh, once we have that, we apply step two, which is to compute an additional coding chunk designed to live exclusively in one rack. So we assume that the OSD zero, one, two, three are in the rack. And for that, we take uh, 
the content of the OSD123 to be data, and we compute a coding chunk that will be stored in OSD0. And step three, we do the same, but in the other rack, where we take the last three OSDs to be data and store the coding chunk that is produced in OSD4. Does that make sense? I like this so much more than the than the last set of <laughs> symbols you used last time around. I like it. I'm getting so excited. Great. Yes. Okay. okay. So <clears throat> now, for that to happen, uh, and I move to uh, remap remapping of data chunks, which is a chapter after the references. Um, I proposed to uh, shortly discuss with Sam the idea of delegating the mapping of the data chunks to the Erasure Code plugins because, uh, and this is a prerequisite to the implementation of the locally repairable codes, but it uh, is independent actually. Uh, I think it. Um, it can be applied to any um, Azure code plugin. So uh, at the moment, we assume that when the crash rule gives, uh, say, eight OSDs, the first K ones will be used to store the data chunks, data chunks. But that may not be convenient if we want to do what we want to do. Uh, so let, let's say we uh, we decide that. The, the code, the uh, original code backend, is able to query the plugin and ask it, where are the data chunks? We still work under the assumption with, that we have systematic codes. That is, the data chunks can be concatenated together and to reconstruct the data. But only we do not require that these are the first uh, chunks provide the first OSDs provided by the crash wall set. Instead, we choose which one are going to be used. We do not go to the extent of choosing um, a position that is not sequential. That is, the D in the crash map that I uh, give as an example. Uh, the first D will have the first. Uh, 25% of bytes of the object, uh, of the stripe, if you like, and then the next D will have the next 25, et cetera. We do not have a way to control that. The, the, the beginning of the data will go at the end and so on. It does not seem to be necessary. Um, for that, I propose the pull request, which is 1911, um, and contains, uh, a small change to the EC backend, which is just in the link after the pull request. Do you have some maybe more comments about that? You you didn't like it, uh, it you you, you um, but we didn't get a chance to discuss it more. Oh, I think I remembered that you convinced me. Sorry, <laughs> I I did have an objection, but you. You convinced me. I had missed oh, something. Okay. You were, I've forgotten what it was, though. Okay. Well, that was easy. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to repeat. Oh, I remember. Your, it was, uh, I, I, I wanted to insist on the first N being data chunks, but you pointed out that that would be annoying uh, when setting up the crush rules, right? Yeah. Yeah, you were I right. I was, I, was, I was wrong. I, I can hardly hear you. That's unfortunate. But um... oh no, you were you were right. It would be annoying to set up the crush rules to insist on the first n acting set slots being okay. data chunks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so the next item is um, the syntax there. So the sorry. Okay. Um, 
the way it will be used by the system administrator. Uh, and that's what I lay out after a locally repaired Rebel code plugin. So the, uh, it's within a profile, uh, a regular code profile. There would be one additional um, key, which is layers, that will contain uh, the strings that I explained first, um, only within a JSON object. And the, the string that follows would be um, the specification of the Azure Code plugin to use. So the idea is that the LRC plugin does not actually implement anything. It relies on another plugin to do the actual encoding and decoding. Uh, by specifying uh, an empty string, it means use whatever default you have. And then uh, you can also change that for something else, such as uh, your own plugin that you want to try. And then there would be the rule step, uh, rule set steps. So uh, I I had a, a hard time with those. I see what uh, what has been added. The um, thing is, uh, at first I thought it would be more convenient to specify something related to the rule set at the same time as the um, uh, specification for the coding chunk placement and so on. But it's uh, it does not map. So uh, I propose that we specify it uh, in a separate um, variable. Now, I chose not to describe the rule set, but instead stick to uh, what is uh, strictly relevant to the layers. So the idea is, uh, is to help the system administrator who want to try something that is not too far from the example that is in the documentation, just to tweak it a little. But in reality, if you want something that is advanced, you're more likely to create your own rule set from scratch and not use rule set, rule set steps to express uh, exactly what you want uh, with all the finesse of the syntax. But I, we, we could add um, take and emit and all the steps uh, that, but I'm, I'm balanced, why not? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they can always customize this profile, right? They can always change it, sure. or they're, they'll always uh, they'll they'll modify this profile for their particular cluster. So they would have like yeah. LRC yeah. across racks or something would be their profile, and they would specify. Yeah. Yep. But you're you're right. Uh, actually, I agree with the tech default um, because otherwise it would be the uh, yeah. There is another yeah, think, argument, which is a uh, failure domain, but it, it's a better fit here, indeed. But yeah, I, I don't like, much. yeah, I, 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 I don't like this. Yeah, both is a way to say I don't like it in French. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Because it's, it suggests that, oh, yeah, I, I know that I can do that. Um, in the syntax, so the syntax must be supported completely somehow. And well, I mean, effectively, it's just a rule, right? It it those is, are all; yeah. those are the complete steps. It's the full set of steps. So, yeah, you could have one of these that's like, you know, choose, but then, well, whatever. Yeah, you could have multiple emits if you had a weird rule. And we we could also just use the. Um, the crush uh, syntax. Exactly, yeah. Instead of trying to make something, uh, yeah, maybe it's better. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, does it actually need to be here? Can they just not 
have a two-step process up here they create a rule um Post that could be... create simple but lrc and then create simple or whatever it is whatever the command is and oh yeah that's here, a good idea say, actually yeah say, because yeah yeah it's a good idea because what what happens is if you do not say rule set uh rule set steps it will just uh, create a role that is fit for a original coded pool uh, mm -hmm. and it will work only uh it will not be spread among um yeah, it won't be that right. are interesting but it will actually yeah. work so for the purpose of just trying it uh yeah it's probably just not necessary well if if it if if this triggers the path in the monitor that's auto creating the the default dish rule um right now it's just hard coded to specify whatever the default failure domain type is that's in your config or whatever right it creates a it creates a generic simple erasure rule yeah right so we can extend that code so that the plugin the erasure plugin if it sees that there are multiple layers it's like oh there are three layers um well actually it's well it needs to know how many failure domains there are yeah yeah it's hard coded in the original code plugin not in yeah. not elsewhere so uh yes uh, it will be delegated to lrc and lrc will come up with something yeah okay so i mean that we could do that right and and there would we would probably just have to have a add a config option or something that's that specifies the two different failure domains <laughs> default failure domains mm -hmm. right now there's a default there's one config option for a failure domain you know what I mean? Um, the the default is host. Yeah, so there'd be like a host to crush default choose leaf type or whatever two or something. I don't know. Okay. Or I mean, whatever. Yeah. In the meantime, I think yeah. just doing the real set. Yeah. Okay. At least to get the implementation in, and we might need to make the um, the create simple command um, something besides create simple that makes a two tier fresh rule. So instead of create simple, it'd be like create two tier rule. Da, da, da. Okay. I guess, yeah. Maybe I will. I will try to to make a fake command and ask people if they understand what it means before yeah, trying to yeah. implement it. Um, yeah. Because what, what I have in mind is often not what people not understand. Not like this. Yeah. Okay. okay. That sounds good. Um. Okay, so uh, that that would be exposed to the sysadmin, then he would uh, he or she would just use our C profile, uh, and um, okay, uh, Coleofuscus uh, likes it, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I I wanted to go over what happens um, regarding the remapping of chunks and specifically what happens uh, when we decode things. I think it makes sense, but sorry. Yeah. Um, I think it makes sense, but I never actually went into detail about it with anyone. Um, so it starts uh, for encoding, we take the first layer and then we take the second one and then the last one and we apply um, the encoding to the result uh, to the result of the previous one of course the constraint here is that the sysadmin has to know that he should not come up with layers that override uh, the result or the data the original data um, 
in the proposed implementation, uh, I implemented various uh, safeguards to prevent mistakes. Uh, but this is a little tricky. But, but to think about it, it's really simple, I think, regarding encoding. Now, what happens when uh, we try to decode is a little bit more involved. So uh, it goes from uh, bottom to top. So it, let's say we want to decode uh, 143, which is the second chunk. And uh, then it's missing, but uh, the other chunks from the same right, presumably, can be used uh, to retrieve it. And we only need one layer to do so. Uh, it turns out to be the second layer, so the layer that starts with CDD. And then uh, because we have recovered all we need, then we can stop uh, the, the iteration. So we do not need to consider even the first layer at all, which is the goal, of course. Now, if it uh, turns out that we miss one chunk from that can be recovered from the uh, two independent local layers, each of them will recover the chunk. And again, uh, iteration will stop before reaching the first layer, which is the more generic one. So that's the second case. Um, now, it may be the case that two chunks are missing and they are both in a local layer, which is not able to recover them because in this case, we uh, have local layers that can only recover one um, missing chunk. So in this case, there is no other uh, way but to come to the first layer, which is the only one able to recover from the loss of two. Um, two chunks. And now there is the last um, recoverable kind of uh, error is when you have three chunks missing. Uh, two of them are in um, a local layer and the third one is in a local layer. So the third one is in the local layer and can be recovered because there is only one missing. So uh, because of this local layer, you only have two missing when you climb up the layers. And so when you reach layer one, uh, which is able to recover two missing chunks, then you're in luck because you can do that. Uh, and the last, the case is when you cannot recover because you have three chunks that are missing from um, in a place where you cannot combine the effects of the layer together to get uh, all the all the chunks back. So in that last case, if 102, 143, and 106 are missing, like the 102 is a coding chunk, we can always rebuild that one. 143 and 106 are one of the data chunks and one of the coding chunks from the first step. So we should be able to reconstruct oh. both of those from everything from step one, right? Like by actually move, moving forward down the steps instead of in reverse. I um, I heard one word out of two. It scares Sorry. me because so, I wonder if you, you hear me the same or not. Oh yeah, yeah. you sound fine, but you, you talk slower than me too. So. <laughs> um, no, so the, if, if those, so in that last case, you're missing 143 and 106, which is two um, chunks out of that first step where you had four data and two coding. So out of those six, you're still only missing two. So you should be able to rebuild by going forward, by taking, what, I guess, 177, 223, 285, and 207. Can't you move forward starting from the original the original data? The original remaining chunks and coding chunk from step one. Can't you rebuild 143 and 106? And then after you rebuild those two, then you can rebuild 102. I will have to assume that 
what you say makes sense because I cannot understand <laughs> because there okay. are too many. Uh, one word out of two is missing. That's disturbing. Okay. Maybe I should Sorry. call back or something. Sam, are you uh, are you following this? Maybe if you write it I on your IRC. Your um, or ever, yeah, everybody is uh, <coughs> working out. Which which bit are you talking? That, that must be me. So let me find another phone. Sage, which which bit were you talking about? I assume this is the GH locally repairable code Ethernet. Yeah, so line seventy five is the question. So in in these in these other examples of repairing, um, Loic is sort of working backwards with the steps, but you can also move forward. Like if you if you lose a coding chunk from an early step and you have the data chunks or you have enough of that layer to recover them, like you can use any of these layers effectively to recover at any time, assuming you have you have enough chunks. It's not necessarily. Followed by the pound or hash sign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. I mean, I it seems like it's extremely difficult to think about these. Give me just a moment. Okay. If you're a participant, pound or hash, you are now being placed in the meeting. Okay, let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yep. Oh, I can hear Is that you. Better? That's oh yeah. Wow. Oh uh, good. Oh good, okay. Good. That's better. Okay, so online okay. on line seventy five I, I wrote out my question. I guess, so I mean, it, your other examples make sense, um, but it sounded like you were suggesting that you had to sort of work backwards through the layers in order to reconstruct everything. And it seems like it's it's simpler than that almost, that at any point in time, you look at the chunks you have and the chunks you don't have, and you can look at any, you look at every layer and you see, is this layer able to recover any missing chunks based on chunks that I have? And if so, at what cost? And then you just pick the one that's the, the least cost or something something oh, like that nice so yeah. so in this case like in your last example um, 143 and 106 are missing but if you just look at just look at the first step layer one you're missing two chunks and you have four remaining so you can do one recovery in theory you could do one recovery to to build those you couldn't you, you can't use the other layers because you don't have enough of the pieces like layer two isn't right because yeah. you're missing three out of four but layer one is enough so, Loic, I assume you're you're addressing specifically the algorithm currently written. Is that what's going on? Uh, which algorithm? Sorry. Well, I agree with Sage. It, it does appear to be recoverable. So, is it just not recoverable if you make certain assumptions, or it's not recoverable um, in the the way I implemented it? Yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it's not uh, recoverable at all. Right. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think my, uh, something along these lines. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because I mean, in, in general, the local recovery code part won't be able to recover a lot of the time. That's almost the point, actually. So if you start with the local recovery code portions, you will frequently find yourself in a situation where you can't recover, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the thing is, oh yeah, I remember why I went this way, and um, because. Uh, the the primary goal is to avoid uh, soliciting too many chunks. So right, uh, yeah. that's... So you would you would attempt layer three, then attempt layer two, then attempt layer one, right? Or not e not even that necessarily, because it it could be that you could if you go in one direction, so layer, cheaper, maybe right. like it might be so, cheaper, right? So it seems like you should look, you should build a, you should do a, a search and look at all the possible recovery plans. And then assign, associate a cost with each one, and then decide which one's the least cost. Okay. So in layer, if we use layer one for example, we have to read, um, you know, four chunks: one from the local rack and three from a remote rack. And we'd have so, to 
I think we'd have a cost function that would that would associate what the what the IO cost is from that. So it'd be like three times two plus one times one or something. But it could be that there is also a way that you could use the local like two local recovery codes, say, if it was depending on how the layers were. If you imagine like a complicated one, maybe there's a two-step mm -hmm. computation that's all local IO and more CPU that would also give you the same result. Does that make sense? I mean, not in this example because it's it's yeah, only a two-layer yeah, code. And actually, uh, thinking about it, if we try to recover using layer three and layer two, uh, it will be more costly than just using layer one when you miss two chunks. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Right. That's right. actually what Andrea actually, suggested. That, yeah. And that's yeah. that's kind of the point actually, because it because yeah. the, the, <clears throat> if you lose one chunk. You could recover using either layer one or layer two. Say you lose the the third slot. There are two different possible recovery plans, yeah. and you need to put a cost associated with them and decide. Like I think we, I think the problem with what you're doing before is you were just assuming that um, later layers are cheaper, and instead yeah. you should just look at all possible recovery scenarios and assign a cost and then minimize that cost. Okay. So why not sort the layers so that? Why not sort the layers so if you do it in reverse order, it'll always be cheaper, and then if you have to, you can go the other way if you can't resolve it. The trouble is I don't think it's that simple, because even in the case where you're missing two, it might be that using layer two and three separately is still faster. It depends on the cost of, cross, of crossing the rack boundary. Yeah. In other words, we want the yeah. weighting function to be expressive enough to capture that case, so we have to actually consider it. Yeah. And I think it's also going to it's also going to change over time too. Like the current or the the initial implementation is going to have all of this done by the primary, and so right. using layer three to recover something in layer three is going to be expensive, kind of no matter what. Sure. You're sending it all between racks and then back again. Oh yes, right. So right. I think I think having and so being able to have that cost function and express it, I think, is going to be important. Yeah, but I mean, even I think, even if you have the cost function. We, you can't just assume that just because you're using two layers instead of one, that it's cheaper. Yeah. The cost function yeah, right. will later need to be expressive enough to handle the cross rack case. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although probably in most simpler cases, uh, an ordering will be mostly right. But whatever, I think we might as well just, I don't think it's that much work to sort of build a sort of all possible. Well, okay, so I, th I think, hmm, okay. So there are two things with the recovery plan. We want it to be not wrong, and we want it to be not slow. So first, I think, is to actually enumerate all possible recovery plans and find the shortest one. Mm -hmm. Then we can yeah. use that to test whatever not hideously expensive heuristic we come up with to uh, replace it. Yeah. Yeah. So Later. writing the first um, uh, brute force one is, I think, the right first step. And I think the brute force is going to be not that expensive, too, because in general, it's you like at all possible. You only have to re do a recursive descent once you find a layer that will recover at least one missing chunk. And there aren't going to be that many. <laughs> They're going to be like two. Or one. There will frequently be two. Yeah, but you will but once, have but once you re but you'll recurse and then there'll only be one. Whatever you'll have one less. Whatever. I think it's not going to be like a an, at an expensive iteration. To Perhaps do, not. I guess is my point. No. Anyway, uh, either way, we can write the brute force one first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Makes a lot of sense. Nice. Cool. Okay. Um, and um, did I have something else? Let's see, um, taking advantage of locality. Yeah, that was, uh, it's an open question. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts about um, making so uh, recovery can happen uh, locally? It's like, actually conceptually straightforward. Um, all of, I don't think there's any reason to push the ordering consistency stuff out of the primary. I think the only change is that instead of pulling the relevant pieces and then pushing them, the primary sends, for lack of a better word, a remote, wait, what's the word? Uh, remote RPC. method call, and an RPC yeah. to the replica. 
with the relevant information that it just does. Yeah. yeah. It, I don't think it's conceptually hard at all. Yeah. And they'll, it'll throw up its hands if there's a peering event like everything else. Right. Right. Yep. OK. And I think, uh, I think okay. there were asserts about messages coming from primaries. Probably have to remove those. Yeah. Okay. For these messages, I think that's that's the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. so it, it doesn't need to act as some sort of subordinate primary for its uh, portion I mean, we, of the stuff. Be, like it, it could be in charge of somehow in some weird way ordering access to this object. I don't even see an advantage. I think the primary just tells it what to do and it doesn't. Yeah, I think the important part is to remove the data path from across the data center, but like exactly. the primary might as the well still be path. calling the shots. I reconnect immediately because you're working up again. I guess, I guess it's something to do with uh, the duration of my call. Uh, I'll be back in 20 seconds. Sure. Okay. Hey, Sam, you you remember when we read the it's the Facebook LRC paper, where I mean it's the same basic idea, but they used a specific choice of the matrix that means that one of the encoding matrices, the local coding matrices, can be inferred. Well, remember they hang on I, I pretty i think it was the microsoft one actually it was the azure paper oh was it i thought it was i thought it was, uh, it was i thought it was facebook uh, hadoop lrc I remember. But basically so they, it was, they carefully uh, chose the matrix easy, though, right you have you have nine data chunks and one lrc for each one. Oh no sorry it needs to be more it needs to be 12 data chunks and one lrc for for each group of three which gives you four lrcs but one of them is like, wait, no. The, the, one of them can be inferred somehow. I can't remember how they did that, but I'm just wondering if if, if that can be captured in here, like yeah, if, I, the I, layer two, or if it, wait, it would, I, if it, it just coalesce yeah. into one big layer, basically. Do you remember what the win is? It's one less. It's one less chunk to store. I know. Um, do you remember how they did the inference? No. Oh, in fact, it's a diagram that's in that blueprint. If you have that open, uh, one of them. The third, the third parity block oh. has dotted. It says it's implied. Wait, which one? Which which blueprint? Um, I've the, got two. The now. blueprint for this session. Here, I'll put it in the channel. Yeah, the page doesn't list a blueprint. Just to be to tab. Oh, okay, it's in the. I just pasted the link in the RC channel. But that that figures from the paper. Ah, yes. Okay. So how did that work? Wait. I think basically it's that 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 parity block could be reconstructed from S one and S two. Also, somehow, how the hell? Is... Or, yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> Or all the other, I don't remember, whatever. But it, they had to store one less. I'm just wondering if, not that it's that important, because ultimately I think the flexibility is probably more useful and that the overhead is like going to be like 3% or something. But I'm just wondering if this particular encoding scheme could be captured within the framework. Yeah, I can't figure out what it is yet. I'm back. Yeah. It was also okay. called clever. Did you hear that? Do you hear the question, Luke? No. The, so the in the Facebook paper, the locally repairable code that they did. This is the paper where the the figure came from that you yeah. put in the in the blueprint. They didn't have to store the final implied parity block because they used some, you know, weird linear algebra trick to like make sure that it was carefully chosen to be inferred from. The other parity blocks, basically, something like that. I can't remember exactly what the details are, but I guess the question is whether um, that particular tricky scheme could be captured within within the framework that you've described. Oh, I see. The process you. of putting together P1 through P4 happens to result in something that is implied by the original 10 file blocks and their local parities. Is that what's going on? Okay. Right. Yeah, 
Wouldn't you just use a related level one and level two? You just use algorithms right. level one and level two such that you got the right answer, right? I guess. But but there's like right. there's this. Because no you have two possible ways of generating the same priority block, and there's no way to phrase that in this language. Yeah, right. I guess that's, yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. You're right. Uh, well, I mean, actually, I guess each if, if you think of each layer as a parity declaration, then yeah, you can't. But if you think of it as a logical dependency graph, then sure you can. You just add an additional phantom layer, and you just make sure that whatever piece of code is invoked knows what its role is. Uh -huh. I mean, it's kind of like I'm not sure how you pass saying, information. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you again. I guess uh, we're out of luck uh, for me understanding you consistently. I will have to listen okay. to the recording. Well, we can. I mean, this is, I think at the end of the day, this isn't that important. Um, but it would be kind of, it would be nice if we could capture that, but it's not the end of the day. But we can, well, we can actually, talk about hey, Louis, can you hear me? Now I can, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll try to talk slowly. <laughs> Uh, can you specify different uh, coding algorithms at different levels? Yes. Can you Actually, parameter? Uh, each uh, each level um, designates a plugin. Right. So to describe the diagram in the blueprint, it seems like level one would define ten data blocks and four parity blocks. Level two would define five data blocks and one parity block. Level three would define five data blocks and one parity block. And level four would define four data blocks and one parity now, block. For now, you, right? now, you're break, now you're breaking up again. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Uh, sorry. Oh. This, this is a very common problem with the phone interface from BlueJeans. So. I wouldn't be surprised if it's getting better, uh, more worse than over the time. I see. It's very common. I see. OK. Right. Um, I, so I'm not sure what, uh, what the question is, but yes, you could choose different plugins at different levels. For a different layer. Uh, so in order to capture this, way. we would need to be able to define a phantom guard, which is never actually stored anywhere. But can be used as as an intermediate result. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. I wonder. That, I mean, maybe you just it's, you just put something that's like off the end of the crush array, like crush is giving you. What, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Fourteen, fourteen, and you just put something in the fifteenth position. Yeah. And so you can you can calculate it and use it as a result, but whatever. Yeah. But to, then you, you, you get to the algorithms to, to generate the uh, same. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Well, let's. It's I mean, we can we can move on, and and talk about it when Louis' phone's working. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> We're halfway into the next session anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. Um, did we have anything else we wanted to add to that one, or you want to jump into the erasure coding? I mean, the two kind of seem to blend together. <laughs> oh, they're all the same anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let me... Let me switch it over, and we can at least breeze through the uh, discussion, and maybe we can hear from the Google Summer Code stuff. <laughs>